Now, what, why should we be interested in comet outbursts? Well, amateurs are really best placed to discover them, <coughs> to, to, to register that a comet has changed. And because there are so many of us now observing worldwide, you know, they, they will detect it uh, within even hours of the actual event happening. And that was the case with Comet Holmes um, as well. And um, when the important thing is, we d if we do our bit and we, we no no notice that a change has happened and notify the powers that be, and especially professional astronomers, they then have access to instruments and telescopes worldwide, which can actually then uh, probe the innards of the nucleus because they've been ejected out into space for all to see. So th that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in the subject. The talk, I've only got 25, 24 minutes, and it basically uh, it's just in three bits, a, uh, a quick description as to what really outbursts are phenomenologically, uh, then to talk about how, how you might measure them, what people are doing and how to go about it as an amateur observer. And finally, just to give a few examples of the results which make these things stand apart from anything else out there in space. Um, now, talking about types, <coughs> essentially you can think of them as three different... We know what a comet, a normally active comet is, and sometimes they talk about jets. Now a jet for an outburst will last potentially for days but if you look at the 67P Rosetta this is an example of normal activity. It's not a jet, not an outburst and those pictures are taken exactly one rotation after the other so uh, nothing has changed in, in 12 hours or so for it to rotate. Now a, a jet is something, these are from um, the ESA website uh, which appears just for minutes. This is 67P. Now 67P was a really well toasted comet with very lo low amount of volatiles and it isn't really representative of most comets. You've got, it, you actually, if you look at most comets, they've got almost 10 times the amount of volatiles as 67P is. And so where it has a jet outburst, they only last a short time. And here are some examples. Um, they'll switch on just for 10 minutes. Uh, they actually don't know quite how long it lasts, they last because they're only taking pictures at a fairly slow cadence. But, but, so there's a jet type outburst. And when you see that from the ground base of another comet, what you often see is a jet that's long lived for several days and then as the comet rotates you see a spiral. Now that never happened with 67P. The most active outburst from 67P was about three months before Rosetta got there and it, Rosetta itself observed the comet and saw it outburst but it never did anything like it and I think Alan and Colin Snodgrass will show you that seen from the ground it never got really brighter than more than about 10% during any of its activity. Um, the other type is, is, a, is not a, a linear sort of uh, collimated uh, jet, but it's a it's plume. And the one on the left, in fact, has now been shown to be a cliff that fell uh, near perihelion, and it created that effect. Okay. Now, the sort of real outbursts we talk about are fragmentation, and then really sudden outbursts. Now fragmentation is caused by the heat from the sun weakening the uh, surface of the comet and al allowing it to break up. Here's an example um, uh, Ikea Murakami and that's an HST image. It's actually th that's not um, well, that's the, the nucleus on, on the left is not the nucleus it's actually one of the pieces. I'll show you that later. But just get you to think about one thing, to do with comets breaking up, the thing is, and, and John Shanklin explained that comets reach maximum brightness so many days after perihelion, and you can actually track from apparition to apparition how that changes. So it's where the heat of the sun is reaching a maximum. So one way of thinking about that is to think about, sorry, the angle Where's the pointer on it? Is it's it the middle button of the oh, that one? In it's the there. Green. Oh right. Yeah. So 
<coughs> this is perihelion in this direction. So as the comet comes round and passes perihelion, this angle, it's just a simple angle on the ellipse, is called the true anomaly. It's a fancy name for, the, for that particular quantity. And when it reaches up helium, it reaches 180, and then it goes into meg negative, so it comes down as minus an angle. So think about that, and think that if heat is responsible, then it's when a comet is near perihelion, and so the true anomaly is at very low, low figures. So the third type are what I call more explosive events, which don't last, the actual initiation only lasts minutes, maybe an hour at most. And, and what we've got here is a different process or processes. As we know, comets are all very varied, but also just because they outburst, they're not all outbursting for the same reason. Some are by fragmentation, but there are other reasons, so other things going on yet to be discovered. And you know, I, I've looked into that and published some hypotheses on it. So this was uh, made up in 2015. It's, you won't be able to read the detail, but it's a list of uh, really significant outbursting comets. And basically, there's Jupiter family comets here, then the central comets between Jupiter and Neptune, and then the longer period Halley type comets. And you can imagine that the processes are rather different depending on where a comet is relative to the Sun. And these are the true anomalies here. So all the Jupiter family comets all tending to happen close to perihelion. And it's, it's very much tied in with fragmentation uh, with a comet at a relatively low perihelion distance. Comet Holmes is, is rather an exception to those groups. But then you've got the interesting group which are the central comets. And, the, and even Jupiter family comets were centaurs once as they appro in a bit in distant past and approached the, si the Sun. And then also if you look at the long period, they also will outburst well away from perihelion. What's going on? There's no extra heat there. So what's happening? And this is one of the fundamental um, uh, uh, questions in, in cometary astronomy is to understand why outbursts happen and this is why it's important to observe outbursts in comets. Uh, I've just underlined uh, Keia Murakami. It was on my list and then a few weeks after it was pub the list was published it, it actually um, was found returning t on its next apparition as a, a fragmented comet and then we saw this picture but this is also from the HST and this is the main nucleus and what I showed before was just the fragments and so in fact that was really proof of an ex example of most of the Jupiter family comets when they outburst are, are because of fragmentation. Uh, that's just the detail, see how many different parts. The, the actual nucleus is about 200 meters across and these chunks are maybe 10 meters. Uh, oh yeah, and uh, if we look at um, the centaur type, here's an example of what amateurs, this is uh, Paul Camilleri from the Blue Mountains Observatory in Australia. He picked up the fact that 174P had outbursts and it had only had two other known outbursts in its history that we've known. Um, Peter Burt was, was one of the observers there. Now, that's part one. Part two is what can we do, how do we observe and so on. There's not really time to go into any detail. So, um, if you've got a, a, you know, a good site for your telescope uh, and you can use it a lot, then if there are fa certain comets which are likely to outburst, then 41P was, is one of the examples, then it's good to observe them regularly because you may be the one that first catches it. Uh, but you can use robotic telescopes and of course there's the eye telescope network and these are ideally placed for monitoring activity where you want something being done regularly. And there's also the Las Cumbres Observatory network and, um, and some people use that and increasingly I think we'll be seeing more of that for monitoring cometary outbursts. I met up with John Drummond when I was in Australia uh, a couple of years ago I think that's my impression of Wallace and Wallace and Gromit there, <laughs> me doing. John's actually quite an athlete, he's, he's, he's a similar age to me and uh, he's a fine observer and at the moment he's, he's spending a lot of time dedicated on Comet 29P, so he's sending me lots of data on that where he'll sit, leave the telescope going for several hours and that's really good. Uh, this is his observatory as it was a few years ago. He's in New Zealand so 
he's, he's well placed in terms of longitude around the Earth so he can observe when others necessarily can't. Now another keen observer is Jean-Francois uh, Soulier. Now he set up this remote telescope in the south of France. It's an 18-inch telescope and the intention is to whenever the, this comet 29P is above the horizon is visible from the scope he's going to be monitoring it constant to watch it. So I'll show you some of the results that we got to date on Comet Holmes and 29P at the end of the talk. Now then, as, I'll just mention Astrometrica because uh, I, maybe Roger will talk about it as well but it has suddenly become uh, in the last few years because of uh, the availability of catalogues and accurate pho photometric measurements uh, it's possible to measure comet magnitudes accurate to a few hundredths okay? but you do have to follow a particular methodology um, and it was the introduction of the UCAC 4 catalogue which uses the AAVSO's APAS uh, photometric catalogue that makes it all possible and you have to uh, use the right settings you should really stack images we've, we've already seen what uh, the benefit of, of stacking from Peter Carson's point of view d down in South End and it's the same you're trying to get a good signal to noise so if you stack 10 uh, and you stack it at the right speed the comet's moving then the difference is this so this is just a single frame and this is what you would get with a stack of 10 and it's very important because for measuring an outburst you're not now interested in the total magnitude of the comet you really want to know what's going on at the nucleus and uh, you, uh, therefore uh, you actually have to window down your measurements to just to include the nucleus um, also when you stack remember that uh, when you go back and load the stacked image you have to save the stacked image don't measure the stacked image straight away because it only uses the first frame for the photometry you have to remeasure the stacked image and when you remeasure the FITS header only gives you the middle of the exposure so you have to change astrometrica right now as you see this, the brightness of a comet depends upon what size aperture you place in front of the nucleus um, it, it's not like a, an asteroid where you don't have any light outside of the, the main point source you, the amount of light you, you measure will depend on the size of that now if you plot um, your total count within the aperture against the size of the aperture you, you, you get a, that sort of actually it's, actually it's um, re for some reason it's replotted it completely different to what was on, on my powerpoint but basically this is a straight line it sits up here and then it, it runs down in a perfectly straight line and what you have to do is you have to decide on a standard size aperture I've never seen that before where it's gone become replotted from the original the mysteries of power yeah yeah. It's different work. Oh no! Oh, sorry. Ah, I know what it is. Sorry. I, I no. That was a. That was just. That was total count versus aperture. This is v magnitude. That was a linear plot. Sorry. I, I gave this talk at um, at a university and uh, yeah. So it's a straight. Yeah. There we go. So what we've standardised on is what's the equivalent of ten, ten arc seconds square. Ap photometric aperture which is about 11 and a half seconds diameter and if you do that you get really consistent results and so in astrometrica if you look in the log file you'll get this information when it solves the plate and in there you'll see the pixel size so from that you've got to pick the number of pixels that is closest to the nominal aperture we want you all to use when measuring the nuclear magnitude of comets that's sometimes called the M2 magnitude and so in this case you would use f 5 pixel radius and that would give you more or less the, the right size but do pick the size that's closest to the nominal value we're looking for so finally uh, just some examples and of course 17p Holmes is, is the one that really stands out um, I've already pointed out that it actually is quite unlike other J JFCs, other Jupiter family comets and there is something strange and uh, very strange about uh, Comet Holmes and of course signs that th the, the fertile area of science is to go after is to go after the areas we can't explain at the moment and Holmes is, is a prime example 
So uh, this uh, table appeared in the journal a year or two ago and uh, although we all know about the 2007 outburst it was first discovered in outbursts by Edwin Holmes and then shortly after a couple of months later it had another outburst and I've listed the true anomaly remember I said that when the true anomaly is close to zero it's close to perihelion well this is, does have a very close perihelion it's a standard JFC but look, look historically what's happened these are subsequent outbursts and see where they've been taking in the orbit you know, these two here are out towards aphelion so you might sort of question how accurate can you measure a 0.9 mag outburst well here's the plot right, of the date of the reduced magnitude plotted against those of the months and uh, this was Luca Buzzi in Italy they did a measurement here and then these, these are all done up with the Las Cumbres Observatory and you see this is the 0.9 mag amplitude so it, they're, they're discrete events that happen very quickly and furthermore if you, you don't necessarily need to discover it right at the point of outburst because it remains for quite some days later with this expanding coma and twen uh, the, this was a, a, the latest outburst discovered which was in early 2015 and it was about uh, three magnitudes or so so that'll be the subject of a future paper uh, more typically comets outburst in really explosive fashion when they're much further from the sun rather than fragmenting and these are three examples even Halley's Comet has done so um, and what I'll just look at now is 29P this one here this sits between Jupiter and Saturn and it's in a virtually circular orbit so perihelion doesn't really mean a lot um, now what we've done is since we've realized this is so uh, special an object we as amateurs a group of amateurs have been following the comet as often as we we can and this is three years of apparition of the comet as to what it's done and these are these are what are called reduced magnitudes so it's not your actual observed magnitude typically when it's at quiescence when it's faint it's around magnitude 16 or 17 and then when it outbursts it reaches magnitude 12 or 11 potentially so you can see there's a lot going on on just this one nucleus and because at the moment it, it, it has been difficult to understand it um, it's obviously a, a, a ripe source of understanding is in a way of understanding what all comets are behaving like because most comets have to go through this centaur stage like just like 29p 29p is the largest known periodic comet effectively it's about 60 kilometers across and um, its outbursts are explosive and although uh, it's been monitored very intensively it's been very very rarely seen rising from an at the start of an outburst only um, two observers have uh, uh, done that um, let's see. this is Paul Camilleri's again Paul a marvelous observer uh, this is his two data points here and they're 1.6 hours apart so it's a, it takes about an hour for an outburst to develop but the actual outburst lack, is probably only lasts less than a minute to actually take place and it then expands and the sun heats up the material and the debris and you get the, the increase in brightness interestingly you see that little kick there well Jean-Francois Soulier has also monitored that change and that take, took about less than two hours and that's a second outburst following these you can see there's one two and then a third one so these you know photometry of comet outbursts can be done with quite high accuracy and you can discover all sorts of detail um, so uh, I just zoom in one final comment on 29p this is last year's and we hadn't seen this before uh, there's a paper by Jewett, uh, Dave Jewett back in some work in the 1990s when this comet seemed to be um, active although it's quiescent and it's likely to have been this type of behavior where what you're seeing are um, kicks in brightness but at, while it's magnitude 16 or 15 now 
what we've done here is to measure it with two different size apertures so the red line is the tighter aperture and the black line is the larger one so the red line equates to 7000 kilometers radius and the bright, black a larger one but you can see how it's clearly evident that the the comet is doing something and uh, the explanation well um, if you look if you plot these outbursts over time so this is the last orbit of the Sun of the comet so it's about 15 years and there are about a hundred outbursts covered in this it's only in the last few years that we've been really following it closely so all of the fainter ones here were probably missed uh, a lot of them may have, would have been missed previously but what I've done is uh, there's a a nominal solution for its effectively its rotation period and it's around about 57 days or so and if there's only one value that will give you this type of plot where you see a seasonal effect at the nucleus so you get this is a whole year so you get four seasons if the axis of the nucleus is tilted you'll get four seasons and so we see here a very strong seasonal effect from there to there and, and so this is why the rotation period is likely to be right but it, it's not necessarily correct and is yet to be confirmed so what we want to amateurs to to obviously observe this more and other outbursts in comets like a checklist um, to see what's happening now an interpretation of this is that um, what you get is you can get sometimes where an outburst seems to trigger another one and I've, I have published an explanation of that but you also get an effect where you get an outburst and then it seems as though from the same location you get another outburst one rotation later so what I've done is I've, I've scribed on there in red and green those two conditions so in red are what I call the self-triggered events where you get another one following very soon after or even more than one uh, and then the other one is where it happens on, on another rotation and you know this is far from statistically random there's such a pattern on this and the, the key thing now uh, this is my last slide I think is to you know to get more observers and to keep watch on 29p and some of the other outbursts in comets monitoring them because there's a lot to be learned uh, so amateurs like I say they can push back the frontiers of science by monitoring cometary outbursts and Eric Watkins this is just you know an example of the sort of image that you might get but which can tell you a lot uh, uh, about these mysterious objects and there we go is that time? Yeah. Yeah.